here is some information that I picked off of different newspapers or, or the television. Uh, things that we see out there now. We see that the Arctic Greenland ice melts are setting records. It may well be in two more years we'll be able to sail directly from North America to Russia because the North Pole will not be completely uh, filled with ice even during the summertime. Uh, we see too, weather's changing. Look at the Netherlands, Holland, that it's had a lot of snow and normally it has little snow at all. So the world is changing. Uh, we see that uh, Lake Michigan, for example, is down 17 inches this year. What's happening? We see Long Island sound water temperatures are going up. So what does that mean? We're seeing some warm water fish coming in here. So the fishermen are finding a different species of fish. Uh, a lot of our cod are going further north. Uh, we all see in the newspaper, the Mississippi River that may close. It's shut down three times this winter so far because of the low water levels and barges just can't get through. Uh, closer to home, we see that uh, the algae blooms or uh, for example, when you see all the green covering on ponds, uh, for some reason the algae are taken off, they're getting rid of the oxygen in the water. And most notably, you see this down at the end of the Mississippi River. You know, if you look at life at the end of the Mississippi River for 200 miles out there, there's no fish because they've been killed off by the, the pollutants as well as the algae coming in there. Uh, we see in Africa, we had one disease that was out there, a rust disease. It's being spread by the wind all the way up in a short period of time up to Europe. So this is now destroying the wheat. So losses up to 70%. And there's lots of other cases out there how the world is changing. We all have seen pictures or watch television, the glaciers are melting. Um, we know that in the past, there's been a huge climate change when the glaciers melted in North America and put all sorts of fresh water out there. Remember that we have the currents that are circling around the world and they're based upon seawater. And so when we have the Gulf Stream, which goes along the coast of uh, North America and brings a lot of warm weather to us, a lot of warm weather to England also, if that shuts down because too much fresh water is being pushed in there, the world gets cold again. We see the humidity growing up. We see that the temperatures of the oceans is going up. Remember that as we lose sea ice, that white color is not reflecting the sun anymore. We've got the dark color, which is retaining heat. We see down in the uh, Caribbean, the water's getting warmer. If the water's getting warmer, that means we're getting more hurricanes down there. We projected this out there, looking back from the 1900s, and we see this huge rise. This is eight different groups here, which have predicted the rise of the temperatures. This also is very much related to the rise of carbon dioxide. Both of them are parallel to each other and have been growing very much. Is that due possibly to the use of fossil fuels? Is that use of um, too much energy? This could be the case, so we might need to do something. And plants are a way for us to do something. Remember, they are a renewable energy source. What is this uh, global warming that we see? Well, I've alluded to it a little bit, whereas the sun sends the rays down. And even though it's 93 million miles away, it still can warm up the area. It is filtered a little bit by the Earth's atmosphere. Most of it gets through, goes down to the Earth. If it's black, it's absorbed. If it's white, like ice, it's sent back up. If there's too much carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide in the air, it stops it from going back up again. So we start to absorb heat. So as our amount of uh, greenhouse gases, which is the carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, sulfur dioxide, increase, we get warmer. It becomes very important because we have already had a huge food web. 
where we have a lot of interaction between the plants and animals and us. Lake Michigan is a good example. I've showed you here this uh, uh, the benefit that the fish have with plants, the fish have with uh, uh, algae, the fish have with other fish. Uh, what happened here in Lake Michigan? We decided we had too many uh, fish here. So what happened? The fish were brought in by tankers from Europe. And as they discharged their waste, they brought in a lot of fish. Now, we didn't like that because some, some of them were eating away uh, the regular fish that we have out there. So what did we do? We brought in snails. The snails were supposed to kill the fish. Well, unfortunately, because Lake Michigan got a little bit warmer, the snails started to grow. So now we have two problems. We have an uh, invasive fish problem. We have a snail problem. We, to solve our problem, we need to look at these food webs and see how to break it or how to fix it so we can live a much better life. As you drive along uh, Illinois, the Midwest, uh, even the coast, you see row upon row of plants. And usually what's happening there, as you will see, that they have these little signs here. And these signs out here are showing us that uh, something is going on. And what's happening is that these are different types of test crops that we see out there. One right there, there's another one right there. And what's happening, we are trying to find out what is the best way for us to grow corn. We've only had several thousand years of growing this corn. And I'm going to show you pictures later on of what corn used to look like. Now, is this genetic manipulation? To get the best corn, uh, you'll have to determine that later on. We see the same thing with soybeans. We're now able, instead of having two bushels an acre of corn, we're up to over 100 bushels. Now, this allows us to feed the world in a much more efficient fashion. We look out at other ways to look at plants that are out there. This is called the ginkgo tree. You see them around here. This ginkgo tree is very nice on the landscape. We grow very beautiful trees out there, but it also has some fruit. And down at the bottom here, there's that yellow round thing. Looks like a small apple is actually a ginkgo fruit. Let me tell you, it stinks. It's got a foul odor. However, it tastes pretty good. So the Asian people will use this in a lot of their festivals. Not only does it taste good for them, we have found that it also improves our memory. It may help us with Alzheimer's disease because it stops the platelets from sticking together. We're going to expect, inspect a lot of different plants over the next 15 years to see how they help us. Here's an example of a plant burr. As you walk in the woods, you may find that some of these burrs stick to your plants. Certainly uh, animals, when they pass on by, you can see all the thorns that are up here that cause these to stick to animals as well as to our clothing. What did that do? That's how people found Velcro. Uh, a British, a British uh, scientist looked at this under a high microscope and found these little hooks and decided he made Velcro out of this. Uh, here's another example. This is the Osage orange. Uh, this was all throughout this area. And the colonists loved it because you could cut it off into chunks. And you know what fence posts look like. You could cut it into a fence post, stick it in the ground, and not only would it be a fence post, but it would grow. So there were all these hedges of this Osage oranges. It had thorns on them. So when they were first growing, animals didn't want to go through here. So it was our first idea of what barbed wire was. Someone looked at this and made barbed wire. You don't see them as much anymore around here because as you look at that fruit there, it's about the size of the grapefruit. And you can imagine what happens if it fell on somebody or a car. Um, the thing to remember is that we don't know everything about the plants. And every day we're learning something more. Uh, we're learning new farming techniques. 
this is a picture of an aloe vera plant. And I'm sure that many of you had this uh, in your kitchen at home. Maybe your mothers broke it and the jelly oozed out and they put it on a burn. Well, we just found out in the last five years how this worked. And the funny thing is, it turns out it's like a combination of uh, aspirin with a mild antibiotic and antifungal. So you can go to the health food store, take this. You can buy just the jelly, take it. And yes, it will cure your burn, but it also will cure your headache. If you have a migraine, you might be able to take this sap and it will cure the migraine. Uh, people use it now to treat cancer. So there's a lot of things out there that we just don't know. Um, just imagine uh, this was being used by the Egyptians and it took to now, it took over 4,000 years to find out why it worked. We have groups where we study this now. Uh, this is called uh, uh, ethnobotany, which is the study of plant uses by various societies. And most of the times it was trial and error. Most of the times uh, someone ate that plant and possibly passed away. Sometimes people ate the plant and got sick and they learned, well, let's take the skin off. It'll be fine. Uh, some people learned that uh, if you took this plant and you were suffering from congestive heart failure, you got better. Some people learned that uh, if you take, took this plant, you cured malaria. These are the things that uh, uh, we're going to look at.